All right, good morning. Happy Friday. I mean, it's good. We made it to the end of this first week. Um, we're going to continue talking about organic chemistry, which is the next section. Now, up here, I've got several piles going of uh, chromatography lab, problem set two, take home quiz one, and the Lewis structures lab. Turn that in before you go. Uh, if you have not, as I was just telling uh, Donovan, uh, I think most people in here, oh geez, I don't know, I can't remember my own name at this point, but um, I think most people in here have reserved a class presentation compound. If you haven't done it, get out your phones, man. Email me, because the deadline is 9 a.m. I would definitely have a little bit of flexibility. Uh, that would be the other thing. And then Monday, I'd like you to bring what you have done of problem set two with you. Problem set two is what we're gonna go over on Monday, but it's not really due until the next week, uh, Monday. I also want you to bring copies of both the valence bond molecular orbital lab and the organic chemistry lab. And those labs, we're both gonna go over both of them. Uh, I'm gonna try and kinda get you going on them so you can finish them up. I do wanna make one announcement. Uh, next Wednesday at 1.10 p.m., my Wednesday group meets section H1. And during that time, we will go over problem set three and the organic chemistry lab. And I don't really have a dedicated time for that with section 01. If you think that would be of use to you, I'd love it if you want to come hang out. Just for the problem set, just for the lab, the whole thing, whatever you want. Uh, it's Wednesday, starts at 1.10, goes until 5. You can come early, leave early. You can come late if you want. You can do the whole thing. You don't have to go at all, but it is an option if you'd like to. We're going to figure this out. We're going to get up to speed. Questions on anything? Organic chemistry is a huge part of chemistry. It's the biggest chemistry part by far. Like there's 20, 30 million compounds supposedly known, and almost all of them are organic chemistry slash biochemistry, stuff like that. So we're learning how these things are made. And one of the things I really want to get across in this section to you is the nomenclature, how to name things. Because when I took organic chemistry, it snowed me over. All right, I was feeling really cool after my equivalent of Chem 223. I'm like, oh yeah, I got this, no problem. And I was totally wiped out during my first term. And I don't want that to happen to you, I'll be honest. So we're going through some of this stuff just to give you a heads up in case uh, you too take organic. If you don't take organic, uh, don't lose any sleep, you'll still be able to read things on labels a lot better than you used to, and you'll be able to kind of understand some of the pharmaceuticals that maybe are going to be in your sphere. Uh, so there's advantages all, all the way through. So on Wednesday, we looked at the alkyl groups. Alkyl groups are the building blocks, and when you combine alkyl groups with other things, you make different families of compounds. And we're looking at the alkanes, and we started with methyl plus hydrogen makes methane. We saw how ethyl plus hydrogen makes ethane, et cetera, et cetera. But then we started to see how sometimes isomers become kind of a little bit of an issue in this. So in organic chemistry, the longest chain, smallest number mantra should be followed all the time, all right? And it makes interpreting structures easier. It's a little weird at first, but it is totally doable. So we're gonna go through an example here of how to interpret this name and figure out its structure. This compound is 224 trimethyl pentane. And when you're not used to this, that might seem really strange, so these kind of hints will hopefully help you get it together. Uh, when I see a name like this, I start at the end of the name. And the end of the name here is pentane. <clears throat> now, if you remember from the alkyl groups the other day, a pentyl group is a five carbon chain. And pentyl, methyl, ethyl, all these kind of things are good old tetrahedral. If there's any kind of bonds around them, they're usually just hydrogens. There's no double bonds, there's no other atoms. So a pentyl group with a hydrogen makes pentane. Now you could write CH3, have hydrogens off this one, because remember carbon likes to have four bonds. 
and CH2 and CH2 and CH2 and another CH3. But I'm not going to do that quite yet. I'm just going to show what I call the carbon backbone because we're going to put some stuff on it. Like it isn't just pentane. There's all this stuff in front of it. All right. So I'm just going to put down a five carbon chain, five carbons, and I'm going to number them one through five because that's how many I've got. Once you have this carbon chain, then you can look at the first part and try, as we've seen since Chem 221 means three. That means there are three methyl groups and methyl groups are gonna be found at the second, the second and the fourth carbons on this five carbon chain. So what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna put a carbon, CH3, but it's just a carbon right now because I'm ignoring the other hydrogens. Notice the 2,2 two means I put two methyls on, all right? One on the second one, a second one on the second one, and I'm also going to put one on the fourth one right there. Then the last thing to do is that if you want, you can fill in the hydrogen atoms, which is totally cool. But notice what I've done right here. I put a CH3 on the end carbons because those are like the terminal, the ones that ends. But the ones in the middle, I'm using what's called a line structure. And a lot of times in organic chemistry, this is so, kind of useful. Instead of writing, you know, C, CH2, CH, et cetera, et cetera, they'll use lines to represent where carbons come together. So this point right here, this intersection of these three lines, that's that carbon right there. And the hip chemist knows, like you do too, that there are four links needed for carbon. So if there's a carbon, a carbon, and a carbon right there, there must be one hydrogen. This carbon right there would have two hydrogens off of it because, again, carbon wants to have four bonds. But there wouldn't be any hydrogens off this one. One, two, three, four links to carbons. There's no more room. So everything we've learned since the Lewis Structures Lab is still very relevant in this class. Carbon only handles four bonds. You can figure out then what it is. And when you get used to this, wow, this is an easier way to do it. So just keep this in the back of your mind. But if you see this kind of nomenclature, every time there's a vertice, if you will, that's where a carbon exists. And carbon has four bonds. This carbon has links to one, two, and three carbons. So there's one spot missing. Fill it in with hydrogen. Hydrogen is all over the place. Any questions? Yeah. Can you go backwards? Like if you um, do the 224, I guess it would be the same thing. Mm -hmm case but like on other structures can you go count backwards yeah uh, so yeah so I would always start at the end and then work your way to the left if you start on the left you won't know where to put the methyl groups did that answer your question okay what, here's what I'd like to get across on this slide if you see a weird name like this all right start on the right side all right put the carbons down so it might say hexyl that would be six butyl would be four, all right? Don't start on the left-hand side until you have this backbone. And you can then name, you can number the carbons too, so you can see like where it is. Yeah. And then you have to know that methyl is one carbon. If it said like ethyl, there would be two carbons, stuff like that. But if you know that, then you know that these three methyls will be at the second, second, and fourth carbons. That's kind of what I'm trying to get across here. But it, it should work, Polly, for any compound like this that you see. Now, you have to know what this is, and we're only at alkanes. There's other groups, all right, but at least for alkanes now, you should be good to go. Cool. Other questions? All right. So here's uh, a kind of an example of a kind of thing you might see. This is 2,3,4-trimethyl pentane, <laughs> all right? And I'd like you to draw it. And obviously, <laughs> the things are really silly here, so I apologize. So let's do it ourselves and stuff. And if you want to do it with me, cool. And if you think it's lame, I understand. I mean, organic, inorganic is actually cooler than that. Right. Shut up, Michael. Pentane, how many carbons in pent? Five. Good. So what I would do is start with five carbons. And when you put those down, I would number it. All right, now I'm a left to right kind of person because that's how I read. But if you'd rather go right to left, that's okay too. But I'm gonna go left to right, so I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't really matter as long as you know what numbering system you're using. All right, so I started on the far right. 
two, three, four trimethyl. I'm gonna next go to the trimethyl. All right, now a methyl group as we saw is CH3. And again, what does tri mean? How many is that? Three. three, that's right. So we're gonna have three methyls, three CH3s to put down. And the numbers up there are where that becomes important. So the methyl groups will be at the second, third, and fourth carbons. I'll just put my C's right there. So this is the backbone, if you will, for what this molecule looks like. Now, Strucker says, oh, give me the complete Lewis structure or something like that. Okay, no problem. Carbon, how many bonds can carbon have? Four, that's right, and that's all the time, all right? Don't give it lone pairs, at least in our class, uh, or anything like that. Always needs four pairs. This carbon right now has only one, so you can imagine there would be H's right there. Carbon, again, four, one, two, three is all it has, so I'll put another hydrogen off here. This carbon only has one. I'll put the CH3s around there. I'll do that right here. This one gets a hydrogen, this one gets a hydrogen, this is a CH3, this is CH3. Bam, good to go. This is really what the molecule then looks like if you wanna get a little fancier. Now again, here's this line structure. So instead of writing this carbon, it's just a line right there, and that does make things easier. It is something you'll see a little bit here and a lot more in your calculus. So we use line structures for like quizzes and tests when we do markdown? No, not at all. That's totally cool. You bet. There's lots of cool things you can do with these if you get it. Questions? Yeah. Okay, so I noticed that you put like on the end to the right is CH3. Does it matter? Do you have a preference if you want us to write out all the H's or the Once you get past the Lewis Structures Lab, which you've turned in, this is the way to go. Because, <laughs> right? oh man, man, it gets to be a real drag, you know, H, 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 you know. Like, anyway, you, it, look, chemists are lazy, all right? So, yeah, uh, so this is a definite way to, to save some time. Now, Luke is probably going, uh, oh man, this is like too much time to. If you really want to get fancy, all right, well, this is a carbon, two, three, four, five. This is a carbon, one, that would be the second position, three, four. Oh yeah, no carbons or hydrogens. Now, it took me a while to do this kind of stuff, and by all means, you don't have to do it that way. But you can see how there's different variations on these names. And Lynn, you pick the way that works best for you. I want you to see some of this so that you're used to it. But honestly, you decide what's best. On the, on the left side, we have H3C. Do mm -hmm. you want us to write it like that? I know it doesn't matter. Well, it might matter. The reason it's written like that is because carbon is connected to carbon. So if you wrote like here H3C, it would look like hydrogen was connected and hydrogen can only handle one bond. It's not the end of the world, Bonovan, but that's, that's why it's written that way. Good call. Try to do it that way, but I don't think I would be that upset if you did. Now, alkanes are great, but they're really pretty worthless for most organic chemistry reactions. The alkanes are great fuels. So like our natural gas outlets here are basically methane. And when you uh, have home barbecues, they're mostly propane. And if you have a cigarette lighter, those are butane, et cetera, et cetera. Gas is octane. But that's about all they're good for. I mean, there's more than that, but that's, that is kind of it. So now we're gonna look at some other families of organic chemistry. And the first one we'll look at here is called the cycloalkane. Now a cycloalkane is just like taking the ends of your alkane and putting them together, all right? When you do that, you have to remove a hydrogen off each of those end carbons so that they mix together. Because again, carbon only handles four bonds. So here are some examples. Cyclohexane is hex is six, one, two, three, four, five, six in a row like that. Now in this point though, we don't have any CH3s like Donovan was just asking, because all the carbons are connected to two other carbons. So each of them will have two hydrogens around. Here would be the line structure for it, all right? Uh, cyclopentane would have five, cyclopropane would have three. Uh, this is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, well, anyway, it's one, two, 
three, four, five. Looks like it's cyclohexane, yeah. But you can have cyclobutane, which would be four carbons. All this kind of stuff is possible. One thing to note. Uh, on Wednesday, we saw that the general alkane formula was CnH2n plus 2. So, for example, if you had N55 carbons and it was an alkane, 2n plus 2, you'd have 5 times 2, 10 plus 2, 12 hydrogens. But a cycloalkane has two less hydrogens. So, a cycloalkane would be just CnH2n. So if you had five carbons, like cyclopentane, you'd have two times five or 10 hydrogens. And all cycloalkanes will follow this. One advantage of knowing this is that you can quickly discern if something is an alkane or a cycloalkane because alkanes have more hydrogen. So here's the question, <clears throat> which of the following could be a cycloalkane? And there's always different formulas. Well, the th way to answer this is, again, to look at the formula CnH2n, all right? C2H4, you can see if n is 2, then 2 times n, 2 times 2 would be 4. This one possibly at least has the right formula. C5, 5 times 2 would be 10. This one is legit. However, this one right here, which we saw on my, uh, Wednesday, 14 times 2 is 28. So this isn't going to be a cycloalkane. It could be an alkane or something like that. Uh, this doesn't have the right formula. This has oxygen stuff, no big deal. So both of these follow the cycloalkane formula, but actually only one of them is a cycloalkane. Can you figure out which one is not a cycloalkane? Good. Yeah. Yeah, you're seeing. If you only have two atoms, they can't connect to themselves, all right? So C2H4, you can't make a loop structure. It's only two atoms. You need at least three atoms to make it happen. So in this one, there's really only one cycloalkane. C2H4 is something else. We'll see that here in a little bit. But the only one here that's totally legit is the C5H10. So you have to have at least three atoms to make like a chain, all right? Two atoms, not enough spaces and stuff. You can't make that loop kind of going. Questions? You can put halogens on the end of the alkyl groups. And these are definitely more helpful and stuff uh, than the regular alkanes are. So for example, if you put an iodine on the end of a methyl group, that makes CH3I, that's, a, that's an actual compound. Um, in the old ways, in the old days, these were always called methyl iodide. The alkyl group followed by the, al by the halide with an ID ending. However, sometimes you will see it now, especially as haloalkane. And what that means is turn iodide into iodo. And if this was an alkane, it would have CH4 methane. So it would be iodomethane. Here's another example. This iodine is off the second carbon. This is one, two, three, a propane if it was an alkane. But because there's an iodine there, it's two iodopropane. Two propyl iodide would have been the earlier one. Then you could also have a bromine, you could have a fluorine, a chlorine, all these kind of things. Uh, they're all totally possible. There's more stuff you can do with these than the alkanes. Probably the arguably most famous of all these crazy compounds is chloroform. <laughs> and uh, does this rag smell like chloroform? Chloroform, you put it over your mouth, it knocks you out. Supposedly, it's been, it's, chloroform is a really interesting compound, both for legit and uh, illegitimate reasons. But um, chloroform is trichloromethane, CHCl3. And sometimes in the old black and white train movies, you'll see like somebody come up and they'll, oh, they're knocked out. I, I've been told it's not quite that effective, but I haven't actually tried it myself. Just so you know, you know, how often the news was posting how to do it with household chemicals. <laughs> You're like, don't do this. It's like how you just gave them all this. Yeah, don't do it, but here's how you do it. <clears throat> Alas. Questions? Now. How about this point, you probably want to start drinking. I mean, alcohol is another family. 
chemistry jokes, so sorry. Alcohol is another family of chemical compounds. All right, now drinking alcohol, just say no, all right, in this class all the time. But in chemistry, alcohol is actually a family of compounds. So just like alkanes could be methane, ethane, propane, and stuff like that, there's a whole bunch of alcohols. Drinking alcohol, the one that I make jokes about, unfortunately, probably, is ethanol. And ethanol is an ethyl group, two carbons, with an OH on the end. The OH makes an alcohol an alcohol. And there's a lot of cool chemistry things you can do with an alcohol. So it's more than just uh, drinking and stuff like that. Um, alcohols have the general formula CnH2n plus 2 Oh, they have an oxygen on the end of them, all right? And so it's like an alkane, but with an oxygen on the end. And there's a whole bunch of different alcohols out there. Um, ethanol itself has a lot of lab uses that aren't good for uh, public consumption, shall we say. In organic chemistry, uh, it was always kind of fun to see what ethanol could be used for. Um, when you get to propanol, you have to start thinking about the numbering systems once again, because propanol has one, two, three carbons, and the alcohol is pretty important to chemists. So if that OH group is off the first carbon, and notice here that I'm counting right to left, not left to right. So this would be carbon number one, two, three. If the OH group is off the first carbon, you would call it propanol. It would be one propanol because it's on the first carbon. There is a newer system that's sometimes being used, propan-1-all. You can use either version. I'm totally happy. Yeah. What happens when you have the iso prefix to the propanol? We use that at work, and I'm kind of curious how to bring that up. Right on. So ISO is old school, and we're not going to use it here so much, but ISO is going to be a, a second position. So isopropyl alcohol would be an OH off the middle carbon and stuff. But technically, it's like old school. It's like saying titanium dioxide. You should use Roman numerals. And you know, oh, chemistry instructor has this fast, but in reality, you see it that way. So yeah, so both uh, isoprop isopropanol and regular propanol are big. And those are just really one propanol, two propanol. The isopropyl alcohol is two propanol. You can buy this at Fred Meyers and stuff like that. It's pretty crazy. Um, there's different um, reasons why this one is a little bit more reactive than the one propanol. So I think it's a little bit more common. So again, when I was taking organic chemistry, one propanol and two propanol were the names that people used. But now things are changing a little bit, which is cool. Uh, uh, propan one all and propan two all <coughs> is the newer names. And so you'll see them both ways. Just realize that that one and two refers to where the alcohol is on the alkyl group. And because propyl is three carbons, you have a choice. And there's differences in how polar they are and stuff like that. So, any questions on that? Um, <clears throat> I need to show you real fast that there are differences in where the alcohol is placed relative to the carbons, all right? Um, reactivity of alcohols is a big thing. And so I'm introducing here what's called primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. Now, all of these have an alcohol, an OH on them. But notice on this carbon, there's no other carbon, all right? This is what they call a primary alcohol. A secondary alcohol, the carbon with the OH has two carbons on it. And a tertiary alcohol, the OH, the carbon with the OH on it, has three carbons around it. Um, all those carbons are donating electron density to the OH, and it does make them more reactive. So I've got some examples up here. I will not ask you any questions about this, but in case you take OCHEM one day, I want you to know about these and how they can exist. Um, this is an important part of organic chemistry. It's not something that we're going to be talking about here. But again, I'm trying to you know, fortify you in case you do take OCHEM, uh, you'll be set and ready to go. All right, so here's an example of a kind of question I would give you, all right, and here's an alcohol, and you know it's an alcohol because it has an OH on it, all right? If you see an OH on it, that's gonna mean alcohol. And the question is, what's the name of this? All right, well, one, two, three, four carbons, 
what would be the alkyl name of a four carbon system? Butyl, that's right. It would be butyl, and since it's an alcohol, it would be a butanol, all right? So it's gonna be something like this, but I hope you can probably realize that, yeah, the numbering system here is gonna be really important. So we've got one, two, three as possibilities. Uh, <clears throat> we could call this one, two, three. Does three butanol or butan three all sound right? No? no, good. I see some people, yeah, good. I caught some of you, but most of you saw. Yeah, I remember on this crazy stuff, we count both left to right and right to left. Now, I am so used in my world to counting left to right. So one, two, three. Initially, it looks like it should be a butan three all or three butanol. But you really need to count left to right and right to left, especially when you're learning. So if you count right to left, it's one, two. A better name for this, butan 2 all or 2-butanol, all right? So again, just remember to count left to right and right to left, especially when you're learning. It'll help you to kind of knock this stuff out. If you said you had some butan 3 all to a chemist, they, it'd be saying, like, I ain't knowing what you're talking about. Like, you'd be talking kind of like a or chemistry hick, I guess. Um, I'm trying to make you sound cool and professional. Questions? A glycol, which is something you've probably run into before if you've ever done anything with your radiator, stuff like that, is what's called a diol. Now, di is two, just like tri is three. A diol <clears throat> means you have two alcohol groups. Ethylene glycol is an ethyl group, two carbons, with two OHs. Usually the OHs want to be on opposite carbons. So the fancy name for ethylene glycol is ethane-1,2-diol. Oh boy. Propylene glycol is a propyl group, three carbons, with OHs off the first and second carbons. It's propane-1,2-diol. So I'm putting this out there because you probably run into ethylene glycol or propylene glycol at some place. It's really common. You can buy it at Fred Meyers. You now know that it's a dye all to alcohols. Yeah. Another example would be using glycol systems for beer tabs. So, <laughs> so pretty much everyone uses it. Respect. I did not know that one actually. So that's I, and hydronic helium and multiple other ways that we use it. There's a lot of cool science and stuff in that kind of jazz. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I actually didn't know that one. Yet, so. Uh, <clears throat> glycerol is a triol. Glycerin, which is also known as glycerol, is just a triol. It has three OHs on it, three alcohols. We'll talk more about these a little bit. That's why it's important. Um, glycerol is a propane, three carbons, and each carbon has an OH on it. Uh, this is going to be something we'll talk about later when we get to uh, some of the forces that react with molecules. Here's a butane triol. There's all kinds of these little things out there. But again, more of this is just kind of showing you what's possible out there. It's not that you have to kind of get hardcore into diols and triols. Now, in an alcohol, the OH is on the end. So you have a carbon with an O and an H next to it. But what happens sometimes in chemistry is that instead of that O being between the carbon and the hydrogen, the oxygen is moved to the middle and you have a carbon-oxygen-carbon -carbon linkage like that. And this has the same formula as an alcohol, but it has completely different properties. And this is called an ether. An ether is probably the most widely used solvent in organic chemistry. And the most common of all the ethers is an oxygen between two ethyl groups, like that right there. So this is an ethyl group, CH2, CH3, and there's another CH2, CH3 on the other side. The common name for this thing is diethyl ether. This used to be available at Fred Meyers and Home Depot, but when the meth epidemic started to get out of control, people were making in their house, they completely shut down uh, public ether uh, 
purchases. And now you have to have a special license and stuff. So here at Mount Hood, we have a license and they use it in organic chemistry, but it's a lot harder to get diethyl ether out. Diethyl ether has some really cool properties we'll talk about um, later. Um, Anyway, here's an example of dimethyl ether. It's just a methyl and a methyl connected by an oxygen. So dimethyl ether. If the oxygen has a methyl and an ethyl group, like this one right here, you can place them in alphabetical order. So this would be ethyl methyl ether. This is how I used to refer to ethers all the time. <laughs> However, when my students went and to took organic chemistry, they're like, oh, Russell, you did a great job, but your ether nomenclature is old school. Oh, man, so back in the past, listening to KGON too much, whatever. So I have to talk about the new version of how ethers are discussed. And I was like, okay, this is really cool to know. Now, <clears throat> here's a compound right here with an ethyl group on one side and a propyl group on the other side. The propyl group has an oxygen of the first carbon. I would have called this ethyl 1 propyl ether because ethyl 1 propyl, good to go. However, in the new way of doing things, what they do is the smaller alkyl group, so ethyl has fewer carbons than propyl, the smaller alkyl group gets an oxy suffix. So this isn't just ethyl, it's ethoxy. This whole group, CH3CH2O, is the ethoxy group, and it's off the first carbon in propane, so they would call it 1-ethoxypropane. They're having the longer alkyl group be like an alkane name, like we saw with iodomethane and stuff like that. So this would be propane if it was an alkane, but it has an ethoxy group off the first one. So this is 1-ethoxypropane. Now, here we have one, two, three carbons, another propyl group, and there's an oxygen with a CH3 off the end of it. <clears throat> so this is, first of all, an ether because it has an oxygen between two carbons. It's propyl uh, in between with a methyl group. Methyl has one carbon, propyl has three, so methyl is shorter. So this will be a methoxy group. It's off the second carbon. 2-methoxypropane would be the name of this crazy thing. Earlier I showed you what I called ethyl methylpropane, or ether, excuse me. This would be methoxyethane. So again, I'm putting this in here because this is something that people do. Uh, you'll now understand this coffee mug in my office if you see it. <laughs> you ether, get organic chemistry or you don't. Oh boy, I know, I need to get a life. <laughs> Stop watching Godzilla movies. But anyway, whatever I need to do, uh, you can see uh, it has to happen. The questions on this? Okay. Now, all of the oxygens we've seen so far have been two single bonds and two lone pairs. So if you have a two single bonds and two lone pairs, it's probably an alcohol or an ether. But there are some important compounds when you have a carbon-oxygen double bond. <clears throat> now, a carbon-oxygen double bond has a fancy name in organic chemistry. It's called a carbonyl. And you're gonna see there's a lot of interesting reactivity that can happen when you have a carbonyl. Um, if you have a carbonyl that's be like this one right here, that's between two carbons, so when I look at it, this is the carbon of the carbonyl, and this carbon has carbons on both sides of it. This makes what I what's called a ketone. Uh, ketones are pretty useful. They usually have really nice smells. If you burn incense, a lot of times the incense uh, has different types of ketones inside it, and that's more than you need to know. Uh, but anyway, if you have a ketone, uh, it's, they're usually pretty easy to name. This one has one, two, three, four carbons. It would be butane if it was an alkane, but it's a ketone, so you give it O-N-E ending. So butane becomes butano. When you get to five carbons, one, two, three, four, five, there it does make a difference where the ketone is. So this carbonyl is off the second carbon. This carbonyl is off the third carbon. 
So you add a two propanone, thanks for playing, two pentanone or three pentanone, uh, then to show you what's what's going on. Um, is this the same as the ketone body synthesis? Yes, definitely. Our body uses lots of ketones, and I'll be honest, I'm not very hip to what those processes are about, but yeah, in biology, if you hear about ketones, they're making C double bond O carbonyls that are between two other carbons. Absolutely, that's right. Cool, cool segue to other types of fields. Good. Um, in this class, you've actually dealt with a ketone already. Propanone, which is three carbons with a ketone a carbonyl in the middle, has a more common name, and it's acetone. And acetone, sometimes we use when we want to dry glassware and stuff like that, we've done it in the hood. Acetone is the common name for propanone. So just like in Chem 221, we saw that water's technical name, dihydrogen monoxide, but only nerd chemists like me use it. Well, acetone is by far the more common name for this compound. Propanone is its official name. Uh, this is something you can buy at Fred Meyer's, stuff like that, so. Now, a ketone, again, has this carbonyl, and the carbon with the carbonyl has carbons on both sides. For better or worse, if the carbonyl carbon has even one hydrogen next to it, the reactivity is quite different. And this is something now that you'll learn about in organic chemistry. But for right now, just realize that this is something, unfortunately, that makes a big difference. So this is what's called an aldehyde. An aldehyde has a carbonyl, just like the ketone. But if it's an aldehyde, the carbonyl carbon, this one right there, has at least one hydrogen. It can have two, like this one over here, but most of the time it has at least one hydrogen. This lone hydrogen does a lot of really interesting things, and this is something in organic chemistry you'll check out. This compound has one, two, three, four carbons. You include the ketone carbon. It would be butane if it was an alkane but because this is an aldehyde, it's butanal. And this compound right here has two carbons. It's an aldehyde because the carbonyl carbon has a hydrogen. This would be ethanol. And I lost several points <laughs> on a quiz in organic chemistry because I thought the instructor, uh, ethanol and ethanol, I thought it was the same compound. It was just their accent. No, no, it wasn't. I learned a lot in organic cancer. Donovan, you had a question. I was going to say, I forgot for the ketones. So what's the, because um, you would have the, the CNH2N, what was the? Same formula. Okay. Same formula. And that's it, Donovan, that's a great uh, thing. So just like uh, we saw how um, some compounds have the same formula, like ethers and alcohols, well, aldehydes and ketones have the same formula too. So Donovan, that was really cool you saw that. This is where you have to start knowing something about the compounds to make a difference. Now, methanol is the simplest aldehyde. It has not just one hydrogen, but two hydrogens off the carbon. Methanol has a much more common name, which is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is used as an agent to kill bugs. It's also used a lot in our funeral services area here on campus. Lots of interesting things with formaldehyde. But if you see formaldehyde, just know in your own mind now that its science name is methanol. And again, methanol and methanol are different. Methanol has the alcohol. Methanol has the key to, has the aldehyde carbonyl to it. Okay, so here's a compound. We want to name it. First of all, we focus on this compound. We see it has oxygen, so it's not just an aldehyde, or not just an alkane. It's going to be one of the things we've seen. Alcohol, ether, ketone, aldehyde. Alcohols and ethers have carbon, oxygen, carbons in them, or carbon, oxygen, hydrogens. But there are no double bond O's with alcohols or ethers. So it's not going to be an alcohol, O-L, like this one right here. It's not going to be an ether. I don't have an example of it up there. This is going to be either an aldehyde, which has a hydrogen next to the carbonyl, or a ketone. So we look at the carbonyl, this part right here. 
is there a hydrogen off this carbonyl? No. So what this is, is this is a ketone. All right. If it was an aldehyde, it would have a hydrogen like right there or something, but it doesn't. So it's not an AL aldehyde. It's going to be an O-N-E ketone. And if you count up, one, two, three, four carbons would be butane if it was an alkane. Because it's a ketone, butanone. So oxygen compounds have a lot more reactivity than just the regular C's and H's. That's why we're focusing on them. Uh, keep, like Donovan's pointed out, which is really cool, ketones and aldehydes, same formulas, uh, but the difference is where this carbonyl is. Aldehydes have a hydrogen, ketones like this one have carbons on both sides. Question. Now, <clears throat> the carbons we've seen so far have all been carbon-carbon single bonds, tetrahedral, all that kind of jazz. You get a lot more interesting reactivity when you start making double or triple bonds. And what I want to do now is talk about triple bonded carbon, which is called the alkyne. If you have a carbon-carbon triple bond, it gets a Y-N-E ending. Now the alkanes were A-N-E, and the alkynes are Y-N-E. So this little beast right here has one, two, three carbons. That would be like a propyl group because it has three carbons. If it was an alkane, it would be propane. But this triple bond makes the reactivity totally different. There's a lot of electrons around that triple bond doing some really wild things. So chemists give this a different name. They change the A-N-E of propane to propine. It sounds weird, <laughs> but uh, yeah, what are you gonna do? Propine has a totally different kind of uh, reactivity than the other ones do. If you have six carbons like both of these do, there is a difference uh, where you can put the triple bond. So if you start from the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, the triple bond starts at the second carbon. That would be two hexane. This one you can start from the right or the left. One, two, three. The triple bond starts at the third carbon. Three hexane. Oh boy. The most common of all the alkynes is ethyne. All right, ethyne, which is a two carbon system, is acetylene. And if you've ever seen the people use torches and stuff to weld, now, a lot of times they're using acetylene, a lot of power in that triple bond you can get out from that. That's why they use it. So again, only nerdy chemists use ethyne usually. Acetylene is a much more common name, but very, very common and useful for what we're doing. Now, a double bond is even more reactive for different reasons than a triple bond. And this is something you'll see in the future too. Uh, just like we changed an alkane name to alkyne when it was a triple bond, you change a double bond from an alkane to an alkene, E-N-E, -E, all right? So alkenes mean you have a double bond. So we back up for a minute. Alkane, single bonds. Alkene, double bonds. And triple bonds, alkynes. So, huh. Four carbons, one, two, three, four. Notice the nomenclature. You can use double bonds with line structures as well. So this double bond is between the first and the second carbons. If you count this way, one, two, three, four, you wouldn't want to call it one, two, three alkene because that's a bigger number. Bute one in or one butene would be fine is the name. Two carbons is commonly, is officially called ethene but a lot of times you hear it referred to as ethylene, and that's kind of an old school name, but just FYI. And uh, we'll talk about this trans thing here in a little bit, cis and trans. So let's go back to this question. C2, H4, C5, H10, et cetera, et cetera. Which of these could be an alkene? 
Well, alkenes also have the same formula as the cycloalkanes. So earlier we talked about how the only one of these that could be a cycloalkane was this one because you needed to make a loop of them. Well, alkenes, you could have a two carbon alkene. If N is two, two N would be four. C2H4 could be an alkene, just like C5H10. So there's actually two of these that could be alkenes. So one of the things that gets really weird in chemistry is these formulas will be the same, like an alcohol and an ether, or in this case, an alkene and a cycloalkene. And you have to do some kind of test or know something else about it in order to figure out like which one it is. And we'll talk a little bit about it here, but again, that's what organic chemistry is. Questions? Organic chemicals normally rotate in solution like crazy. Single bonds are just constantly rotating. But when you have a double bond, it's really tough to rotate. So again, poor Donovan, thank you for standing up here. Let's say I come to Donovan, hey, so good to see you, right? And I just single hand, it would be easy to break that up, all right? But if I did a double hand, oh, I haven't seen you in so long. It's harder to break a double bond up. It's also harder for us to rotate. I'm not a yoga guy, so I'm not going to play part in this. <laughs> right, but thank you, Donovan. It's hard to rotate a double bond. It takes a lot more energy to rotate a double bond than it does a single bond. So what that means is that you can have cis and trans isomers with double bonds. Oh boy. So cis means that the two groups that are the same are on the same side of the molecule. So both of these examples here are butenes, all right? And they have a double bond at the second carbon. So they're two butene or butuene, either way is fine. But the difference here is that notice how the methyl groups are on the same side of the double bond and the hydrogens are on the same side. On this one, the methyl groups are opposite sides and opposite carbons, just like the hydrogens. Cis and trans is super common in organic chemistry. And if you've heard about trans fats, oh yeah, trans is where it's at. So in the trans fats, you've got a double bond. You've got similar pieces opposite like that. Our body, and again, this is way outside of my biology now here, okay, but our body is better at dealing with cis fats than trans fats. And when they use these fats and they hydrogenate them and stuff like that, sometimes they end up with some trans, and trans apparently is bad for our bodies, causes cancer, they banned it mostly and stuff like that. So if you have a compound with a double bond and you have at least two pieces that are the same, so like two hydrogens on opposite carbons or two methyls, then you have to think about if they're on opposite sides, which makes them trans, or the same side, which is cis. And it does make a difference in how they react and stuff like that. All right, I'm gonna skip this page. This just says why uh, Donovan and I couldn't swift around. I'm not a yoga guy. Double bonds aren't yoga people either. <laughs> uh, these are all around us. Um, oranges and lemons smell very similar, but they are different. Uh, their compounds are very, very similar to each other. The differences and what their double bonds, now this picture looks really, really bad, but here's a double bond and there's a double bond. You can see they're on the opposite sides. This is where the differences between cis and trans comes from. And uh, lemons and oranges are similar but different, and this is supposedly why. The one is called limonene and the other one has a different name. I can't remember what it's called, so. <sighs> Questions? Um, this is going to be a good place to stop. I'm going to show you one more type of weird double bond behavior, and we'll talk about The Ring. If you know the movie The Ring, looking at Jacob, maybe you know why I'm getting excited by this, but if you don't, don't worry, I'll show you on Monday. Thank you for being here. Make sure you turn in the stuff down here if you haven't done it already. Have a great week.